kicking off the recombinant DNA and biotechnology section by bringing the parte to Epnot. So put on your neon, grab some glow sticks, and, um, let's talk about recombinant DNA? Simply put, recombinant DNA is made in the lab and contains genetic material from multiple sources. Remember that organisms differ in how their DNA is arranged, but they all share the same building blocks, or nucleotides. Therefore, we can utilize this principle to create many copies of genes by cutting and pasting DNA fragments between organisms. Having said that, let's cover some high-yield recombinant DNA techniques. We'll begin with molecular cloning, a common laboratory procedure that uses a vector and host to duplicate specific genes. The vector is a DNA molecule, often a plasmid derived from a bacterium or phage, that carries the target DNA into the host where it can be replicated and or expressed. We'll use these pink glow sticks and circular rave pendants to symbolize the target DNA and vectors. Ooh, now I want one. Anyways, plasmid vectors have an origin of replication, restriction enzyme sites, and at least one antibiotic resistance gene, depicted by the green glow-in-the-dark gems. All right, so here's how we clone DNA. First and foremost, restriction enzymes cut at palindromic sequences in the target DNA and plasmid vector to generate sticky ends. Just to clarify, a palindromic sequence is one in which the 5 to 3 base pair sequence is identical on both strands. And here's Johnny, cutting up the glow sticks and pendants in the restricted area again. I'm just going to turn my head the other way. These sticky ends, yep, that's really what they're called, make it easier for the target DNA to stick onto the plasmid vector. Next, ligase glues the pieces to produce a fresh recombinant plasmid. Glow sticks go snap, snap, pop, pop, snap, pop, 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 and whoa, look at those colors. That's some straight up art right there. So we've got a recombinant plasmid ready to go. We can actually put that into a host, usually another bacterium. And without further ado, please welcome the host. DJ ABX. Now the fun part. Let's grow some colonies. Or shall I say, watch people colonize the dance floor at the colony. Woo! So how do we select for host colonies that only have the recombinant plasmid? Well, as we alluded to earlier, each plasmid vector carries an antibiotic resistance gene that allows the host to grow in antibiotics. So the colonies that don't carry the plasmid vector will uh, die. Sad, yes, but efficient. And just so you know, there's other screening methods, but we won't address them here. After growing sufficient host colonies, the cells are lysed to obtain the target DNA. To remember that, we added this security guard breaking up the party. And there you have it. That's molecular cloning in a nutshell. Enough dancing for now. That looks a little warm. Let's check out the paint color rave wall as we ramble on about PCR. Simply put, PCR is a way to make a lot of copies of a specific piece of DNA. To do this, we need a few ingredients. Some DNA we want to copy, DNA primers to serve as the starting point for replication, and a DNA polymerase, specifically a heat-resistant one. We also need some nucleotides, or DNTPs, to build the copies, and a buffer solution so things don't get out of control. Assuming you picked all that up at Walgreens, here's three steps of PCR. 1. Denaturation, 2. Annealing, and 3. Elongation. First, the DNA is heated to 95 degrees Celsius in order to separate the template strands. Next, the strands are cooled at 55 degrees Celsius to allow for annealing of primers. Um, I don't think using that misty fan near the fire is the best way to cool off, pal. Anyways, the last step of PCR is elongation. Just in time for a conga line. This step happens at 72 degrees Celsius. Uh, not the conga line. We'd be dead at those high temperatures. But TAC polymerase is pretty tough, and that's the sweet spot to catalyze chain elongation. Speaking of TAC polymerase, here's a bunch of thumbtacks to remind you of that bad boy. So these steps repeat and spin right round, right round like a record. Baby, right round. Every cycle of PCR doubles the number of DNA fragments. For example, four cycles will produce two to the fourth, or 16 copies of DNA. A quick word about a useful variation called reverse transcriptase, or RT, quantitative PCR. It can detect and measure RNA from a given sample. Remember that reverse transcriptase reversibly transcribes mRNA into cDNA. The cDNA is then used as the template for conventional PCR. 
Welp, this party's getting out of hand, and here comes Sketchy Land Security to shut things down. But before I dash, let's do a quick recap. Recombinant DNA is made in the lab and consists of genetic material from multiple sources. Recombinant DNA is used in molecular cloning and PCR. Molecular cloning uses a vector and host to make copies of specific genes. To clone DNA, restriction enzymes first cut both DNA molecules, creating sticky ends. Next, ligase joins the pieces to produce a recombinant plasmid. The host then picks up the recombinant plasmid and is plated on the petri dish with certain nutrients and antibiotics. The colonies are then screened and the ones containing the recombinant plasmid are lysed to isolate the specific gene of interest. PCR is used to make exponential copies of DNA fragments. There are three steps of PCR, denaturation, annealing, and elongation. First, the DNA is heated to 95 degrees Celsius to separate the original strands. Next, the DNA is cooled to 55 degrees Celsius so that primers can bind to the strands. Then, the temperature is increased to 72 degrees Celsius so that TAC polymerase can extend the DNA from the primers and create a new double-stranded DNA molecule. These steps repeat until we have enough quantities of target DNA.